almost had to move the manger outside this morning. There wasn't room. <laughs> I didn't think I was going to be able to get in this morning, but uh, between 2003 and 2011, there was a TV series on Discovery Channel. Mike Rowe was the head guy, and the name of the show was called Dirty Jobs. Has anyone, anyone watched that? Yeah? You know, I really never watched an entire show. I, I call it bits and pieces, but uh, of course, he would, uh, you know, put his hat on his gear and do some nasty job, smelly job, claustrophobic job, high up on some tower with just a cord holding him. I remember one show he, um, uh, that I read about was he uh, got in a shark tank trying out a shark suit with some juvenile four-foot sharks. You know, that was one of the jobs, you know. And, and, but he did these jobs that a lot of people really didn't consider how they got done. There's a lot of stuff that happens that we don't know who does it. You know, I kind of discovered that when I went off to college, and I'm thinking, why is my toilet messy? Why does it look dirty? You know, who, who cleans the toilet? You know, why, why are my clothes stacked nicely in my dresser drawers? You know, why, where do these dirty sinks come from? And that's called mom. You know, that's another dirty. He never, he never was a mom. But anyway, somehow I, I think about him doing that, maybe eight-hour filming thing, but maybe 30 minutes where he was in the the worst part of those jobs, but nothing that a couple showers probably couldn't cure him of. And with Jesus, it was a little bit different. When Jesus chose to be injected into Mary by the Holy Spirit, he knew what it was going to be like. He knew it was 24-7. He knew it was till death do us part. There were so many prophecies that, that foretold hundreds of them that foretold Jesus. In fact, I was reading Psalms 22 just the other day, and, and of course it talks about his death in Psalms 22. When we read this, Psalms 22, starting verse 6, But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me and hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they said, let him rescue him. And that's what people shouted to him as he was on the cross. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. My bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divided my clothes among them, and they cast lots for my garment. And he saw all of this. He knew that was coming. And he came, you know, in that manger, and he left all his heavenly powers behind. All his heavenly attributes, resources, it was a no turning back journey. He had no get out of jail free card with him. He had no beam me up Scotty uh, capabilities. He left heavenly powers behind and he came into this world naked with nothing on him. Philippians 2, 6 put, put it, puts it this way, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He didn't use any of his godly powers to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death of the cross. He came, the Bible describes him and defines him as the second Adam. Adam started, didn't go well for him. He came as that second Adam with no, you know, bulletproof skin, with no, you know, Marvel comic abilities. Uh, Jesus came to this earth as a man walking without sin, and he was empowered by the Holy Spirit to show us how we could do the same and live in his power. Jesus didn't come out of pride or pity, and I think that's important to know. He didn't come out of pride or pity. He didn't show up and he says, let me show you losers how it's done. The first Adam and all you guys have messed up, but I'm going to get it right. All you losers, watch me. He didn't come out of pride. He didn't come out of pity that I feel for you wee little sorry old people that you don't have a shot in the dark. Pity, a lot of people have pity, but it does nothing for anyone. But he came out of of love he came out of love that had action that put his skin in the game he put his skin in the game for us we read in hebrews 2 14 another beautiful passage since the children have flesh and blood he too shared 
in their humanity or our humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of sin and death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helped, but Abraham's descendant. For this reason he had to be made like them or had to be made like us fully human in every way in order that he might be merciful faithful high priest in the service of god that he might make atonement for the sins of his people because he himself suffered and was tempted he is able to help all of us that are tempted and i love hebrews 4 15 beautiful scripture it says this for we do not have a high priest who is unable to to just wrestle through life all the stuff we go through but he was tempted in every way just as we are yet without sin he has gone through every temptation that we have faced jesus came into a dangerous geopolitical world he walked this earth where man you look at someone the wrong way you say maybe something that you shouldn't say and man all your goods would be confiscated you lose your your wife, your kids, your life, go to prison in a heartbeat. During his day, food didn't come easy. It was a morning to night endeavor. He lost his dad. His responsibility, the Jewish responsibility for the eldest son is huge, well written of. It was his responsibility as Joseph passed away that he took the full responsibility of the family so often we have this idea that he just wandered off one day he was there and one day he was gone and left his mom and sisters behind he would have broke a bunch of jewish laws and they he would have heard about it but he took care of them while he was in ministry so he knew what that it was like that responsibility of the house was like he knew what a payroll was like as a rabbi he had 12 people he was responsible for and on his employment team there was a lot of griping and complaining and a lot of them were trying to go up the ladder and around him and, and always fighting about who was the greatest. In fact, it said that one of his practices was he gave to the poor and the person over the treasury was stealing that money. He was a lightning rod for conflict. He addressed both religious and political mistruths. He was misunderstood, misquoted. He was the butt end of fake news. He was rejected at all. He was laughed at. In his death, he was stripped down, and the list goes on. He was betrayed by one of the people he invested in more than any other, by Judas. The other 11 would not even claim knowing him. I often think about this, and and how so often we don't realize that he went through all the stuff we went through. And sometimes I wonder, what, what does that look like when we complain to Jesus? What, 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 what does that picture look like when we say, hey, Jesus, you know, um, you know, you know, my car's like 18 years old. My life is a bummer. Well, what does it look like when we say, Jesus, you don't understand how tough life is right now? My Internet is slower than everyone else's. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder, what does it look like when you say, geez, mom is always putting pickles on my sandwich and I'm, she's done that all her life. Life's so tough. What does that look like? It probably looks like this right here. You know, let me tell you how, how hard I've had it. You know, and so often that's what we look like when we complain to Jesus. But I know there's individuals in here that maybe your maid has walked on you. Maybe, maybe you've lost not only your job or your career or some very close person has died in this past year. And Jesus knows because he was fully human. He walked that and he chose to come to this world out of great love for us. He loved us. He loved us. And I think it shows us that he wasn't a detached God, that he wasn't a distant God, that he wasn't a God that was way out here, we were here, but it was just like, I want to go. I want to be there. And that's the same God that we serve today. He wants to be there with us. He still offers his body. He offers his blood to, to each of us. I like this scripture, Hebrews 12, 2 and 3. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith for the joy that was set before him endured the cross 
scorning the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God to consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you may not grow weary or lose hope. Not only did he come in love, but he came in joy. He was glad. He rejoiced to do that. He so rejoiced to restore us into fellowship with himself and also the Father God. I think about this last few weeks of, as we've talked about Whoville and we've talked about the nativity scene. And the question I think we need to consider just for a few moments is how do we respond? How do we fit in the nativity scene? How do we fit in it? We looked at Mary and Joseph the first week. We saw Mary, that she was willing to say, Jesus, come in, really, virtually, come into my life. And she was willing. And that's a... That's an example to us. Are we willing to let Jesus come in and be a part of our life? I think of Joseph. We spoke about him in the first week of the series, how, how Joseph had this obedience that was quick. That was quick. You know, because we talked about so often, sometimes God speaks to us and we pray and we fast about it for two or three months. We talk to all our friends. We, we have to have some type of vote and, you know, big, you know, survey or whatever. And then two years later, we, we forget all about what God's done. But he moved quickly when God spoke to him. I think about the shepherds who, who Tyler spoke about, how they were common, very average people. Nothing special about them. They were kind of, you know, and, and so often a, a lot of us sit in that situation. Well, why give my heart to the Lord? I, my life really doesn't matter. I'm just a, a, a blurb out on the screen, and, you know, I'm the least in my family. I don't mean anything to anybody. But they had enough wisdom. They had enough insight to know that as common people, they needed an uncommon God, and it was going to change them. And then last week, Darren talked about the, the magi, about the wise men who, Man, they, they had it from the world standpoint of view. They had it together. They had the, they had the resources. They had the titles and the, you know, the, 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 the sheepskin on their wall identifying their PhDs and all their, their knowledge. And they had the position. They had the intelligence. But when they showed up and saw Jesus, they were smart enough to know, whoa, this is the king of kings. They were king makers. But when they saw the king of kings, what did they do? They bowed down totally and they realized that Jesus was truly the son of God and we have these characters playing but there's one other character and our choice is really between these characters right here and one other character the other character is Herod he's the other major character and he's not a part of this nativity scene he's not a part of Jesus being born into the life of people and what did Herod try to do he tried to murder Jesus. Kind of ugly. He, he murdered a bunch of children. A bunch of people died. Brought a lot of pain in a lot of homes. A lot of tears and crying out and weeping. And you might say, I'm not, I'm not Herod. But when Jesus speaks, we, we want to murder that voice. We don't want to hear when Jesus leads, we don't want anything to do. We want to kill that voice. We want to kill that sound. We want to kill maybe that conviction. We want to kill that repentance, kill that willingness to follow Jesus. We don't want Jesus in our life. We want to abort him. And in the attempt to kill Jesus, believe it or not, many die because we never find that place where God wants us to do. And those lives that we would impact wouldn't would impact be there and it's a wonderful life you know you, you see George Bailey and he gets a picture what would happen if George Bailey didn't step into what he was called to do the town would have been different lives would have been lost eternally and that's how serious a matter we're talking about here this morning and I want to ask you that question in Whoville who are you in this nativity scene are you quick to obey God are you bowing down and saying, God, whatever you want me to do? Are you saying, I'm willing, Jesus, I want you fully in my life? Are you smart enough? You think you're so smart. Or we think we're so smart. Are we smart enough to realize we're not smart at all when we're before the King of Kings? He knows, and we need to follow him. There are key moments in our life, and I believe this morning, and I appreciate you just jamming in here like sardines, there are key moments in our life, and I feel like 
for quite a few in here, this is a key moment here this morning. It's a crossroad, and there's a decision that is going to be placed before you, and the question is, what are you going to do with it? I think about key moments in my life, and I, I see them real clearly. I see that moment when I was 12 years old in uh, a church in Orlando, Florida, and it was a big church, and I was a good ways back, and a fellow by the name of Dave Wilkerson was preaching, and he gave an altar call, and it would have been so easy to have sit in that, sat in that chair because it was real embarrassing to step out and walk down that long aisle and say, I need to repent. I need to give my heart to Jesus. Key moment. Where would I be if I didn't do that? I think of, uh, on Lake Harris there in, in Leesburg, Florida, as a teenager where there was a service outdoors, and, and at that moment it was like, who is willing to follow Jesus with the journey he's got before you? And I remember, again, that embarrassment of you know some cute girls being around and, and, and the pressure, and I re- realized I need to move forward. And as I did, I felt God's presence like I had never felt God's presence before. That was a key crossroad. I, th- I think of another time when, when um, two things happened at once. Crossroad, one went this way and one went that way. And I, I graduated from college, and all, almost on the very day that I had the opportunity to go to a non-accredited, it seemed real stupid, go to some non-accredited Bible school out in Oklahoma, I, I had that come, and I, as I was sort of pondering it, I was called in the office where I worked at UPS, and they said, we're going to give you a job of a lifetime right now. You're super young, and we're going to let you be the manager of this station. Unheard of job, you know, and they were so excited about it. And I had to make a choice. Was I going to go this way or that way? And I went this way. And, and I think, what would ever happen if I would have gone the other way? I think about one night, 200, 200 300 feet over the Atlantic, the Jacksonville Pier, I remember I kneeled down to a young lady by the name of Lori Schrock, and I said, Lori, would you consider marrying me? Would you consider journeying with me? And that was a decision that I put all the other little girls behind. I said, you're, you're the one. Would you consider it? And I sweated bullets, and later she said, all you asked me to do was consider it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine sometimes I think she would have said, maybe I should have jumped off the pier that night, you know, but... <laughs> But um, um, those key moments of decision, and I feel like now is a key moment of decision. What are you going to do with this? These aren't just idle words. What are you going to do with this? And it's, it's a drastic. It's, it's a big change. And I'm going to ask you to pray. We're going to pray in a few moments. And I want you to sit where you are. I want you to look at your hands. Just, just hold your hands out. And I'm going to ask you to, to look at those things that you tightly hold and I don't know what that is, but, you know, it could be your career. It could be your image. It could be your position. It could be, it could be your bitterness, your unforgiveness. It could, be, it could be jealousy or envy. It could be your, your fear. And I just want you, in a moment, I want you to grip hold of that and hold it as tight as you can. And this is what repentance does. Maybe your lordship over your life, your intelligence, your success, or maybe your failure. But I'm going to ask you in a few minutes as we pray pray to make a step and release that. And say, God, I haven't done well. I'm going to let it go. Could you take it out of my hands? I'm going to give it to you. And then the last thing I'm going to ask you to do as we pray is to say, I'm going to be like that wise man. I'm going to be like those shepherds, and I'm going to worship you and say, wherever you want me to go, I'm available. I surrender. I surrender. I'm available. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we take our hands, and I pray for honesty at that point, at this point, that we'll put our hands around those things and create it a weapon created a closeness in our life to what you want to do. It could be fear. It could be, it could be hate. It could be anger. It could be status. It could be addictions and love. And we, we have gripped that tight. Our knuckles have turned white. Things that we do not want to let go of. And I pray 
there's, there's some in this room that know that this is a cross point for them and they are going to open up their hands to you. And we open up our hands to you and we repent of those things that we've held so dear that we were so afraid would slip away if we let our grip off them. And we ask you to clean the palms of our hand, your nail scarred hands to clean the palm of our hands because you had hands too and you let things go and we let them go this morning and for those that would dare we worship you we worship you we realize that wow you are the king of kings and there's a day that the whole world will bow and worship you and we choose to do it where it really matters on this side of our life. We worship you and we surrender to the amazing journey that you want to take each of us on in Jesus' name.